Hello, everyone. So we talked about um, basically summaries of data, their location, their scale, their shape. We talked about the difference between a population and a sample. We talked about how to summarizing graphically a distribution using a histogram. We made a distinction between variables that take discrete values and or outcomes and um, continuous variables. We talked about experiment size. We talked about binning of the histogram. We defined the notion of frequency and then we sort of let the number of samples that we have go to infinity mentally and the thickness in of our histograms bar go to zero mentally and then we end up with a continuous distribution of a continuous set of variables then we defined the uh, distribution function first which is always cumulative in nature always a sum from the lowest value to wherever you evaluate it and then we defined a density function which when integrated over a set gives you a probability and so the probability distribution function is again a cumulative function an integral over density function so we show that they're each other's integrals and derivatives respectively then um i said well look a probability density function only has to be positive and integrate to zero to be an acceptable function pretty much and then i introduced two variables x and y derivatives turn to partials integrals turn to doubles we talked about the notion of an event as an area under the rather than a, a domain on the integration axis so an, an, an event a set of outcomes a region of variables that are happening then we talked about joint probability conditional probability given b what's the probability of a given a what's the probability of b and then i said well look a intersection b is a given b multiplied by probability of b happening or alternative b given a times the chances that a are happening and rearranging leads to pa probability of a given b being equal to the probability of b given a times the probability of given of a divided by the probability of b so that's known as bayes rule and i have just posted a second handout which gives you a small short piece of writing by Stephen Strogatz, who's a mathematician who used to write columns for the New York Times, which sort of gives hopefully fun read about Bayes rule. Bayes rule is everywhere all the time. We will return to it. I think I ended by saying, well, look, we are ultimately and sooner than later going to talk about the probability of having a model being true given data observed and that that's going to be related to the probability of observing the data given a certain model multiplied by a prior probability of a certain model parameter or set and then suitably normalized about which we can talk and so i do have this always in my mind that i think of the left hand side of bayes rule as a sort of a data analysis problem already a posterior probability of the model given the data and the bo given a is going to be a likelihood of the data given the model times a prior on the model parameters now it seems like i may be just shoehorning that in here but much of the early parts in this course are about that mental switch that you need to make is that we can only ever calculate distributions by postulating certain model theories to be true and then saying all right now i have data 
what are the implications of that? But that's never what we want. What we want is to figure out what the probability of our model is, given the data that we have. I'm glad this is on record. This is supposed to be confusing, but you have to say this multiple, multiple times, and I'm going to return to it sooner than, than you think. Let me just continue with what I'll call six. I think the best next thing for me to discuss now is to introduce the uh, notion of the independence of events or the independence of variables. So statistical independence. And uh, I'll, I'll write it in the context of events. And so I'll say, all right, well, what is a reasonable definition of event A being independent from event B? Now I'm writing big P for a probability. And when A is independent on B, then it's not going to have anything to do with B. So it'll be just on its own, right? And an additional implication or another way of looking at it is in that case, what is the probability of A and its intersection with B That then is going to have to be the product of the probability. Which uh, follows from what we just literally had at the end of last week, the Bayes rule and its definition. So if I want to write this, you know, in terms of variables, now I'll call them X and Y, you will see you'll have multiple notations, an event A or an event B, a variable X or a variable Y. Um, I could write, and if I have a big P function of X and Y, two variables, that in the case of statistical independence, that's just a product of their probabilities. X and Y resolve in X and Y. And if I want to write this because it equally well applies to little p, the probability density function, then I'll have the product of their probability density functions. X and Y are random variables, right? X and Y here are random variables. A and B here are events. Big P are probabilities or cumulative distributions or distribution functions. And little P are probability density functions. It's a mixture of symbols and interpretations, but it's all ultimately just showing the same thing. Uh, something you know probably from daily life, but I'm guessing that comes from earlier instruction where you're like, you know, these things are the probabilities of winning the lottery today are independent of the probability of you winning the lottery tomorrow, then your odds of winning the lottery on any of those two days are their product. I'm putting that in here now because I'll be needing it later. I think now something that I need to start doing is also um, I'm going to go backwards and forwards on something. And if it's a little confusion, confusing, it's normal. Let's think about a summary of a data set. which helps us give 
ourselves an idea of what the location is, right? Where is the data? What's the body temperature? What is the human height? What is the height of the tree I'm looking at? From a sample, or what are the throws in my diet? Um, in no particular order, I think you were going to say that um, if I take observed values x and I'll index them i and I'll sum them over all the elements from one to n that I have in my sample and I divide by n, then I think you'll agree that you recognize this as I have defined the mean. Okay. The arithmetic mean of the data, sum and divide. Now x here could be continuous variables, could be categorical variables, could be all sorts of things, it's just that. Sum and divide. If I sort of switch my data format a little bit and I go back to my outcomes, m, then I'm working backwards in time compared to my previous lecture. lecture. M is a set of outcomes like the faces of a die. I remember my definition of saying there's a frequency here of observing them in a certain experiment. And I index that as F sub M. Maybe I'll make this red. And then I sum that over the possible outcomes. So now I have the sum over M. And then I divided by N, the number of times I roll my die. It's just a way of summarizing, right? If my X in the previous equation is one, one, two, 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 three, three and a half, four, seven. And the second equation is saying I'm going to list all the possible outcomes. And instead of saying one, one, two, 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 I'll say two times one, three times two, one times three, one times three and a half and a seven. And the total number of entries was big N. And now I have listed the outcomes from little m one to little m being equal to big M, and I've summarized it with that. That's going back to my original definition of F sub M being a frequency, which I claim for me here is the number of times observed for this week. That was from last time. So, all right. If I now X, you know, values, let's say, of this random um, variable or realizations, if you will, so these two here, you know, that's going to relate to a sample, which again is defined as whatever collection of outcomes or values that you have in your bag of temperatures, I like to call it, or your experiment where you went out and drilled 10 holes and you, you have 10 values. So just like I went and said, all right, make the big N very large in value. And if you want to think about having a bin width 
delta stuck in there. You can, clearly it doesn't change. I multiply, or I, and I divide. And I make the philosophical argument that as big N goes to infinity, very, very large, and um, any bin width I may be considering goes to very small, then the philosophical argument is that then the properties of the sample are going to approximate those of the population. Okay, throw it a million times, you're gonna hopefully get the right thing. This is clearly a philosophy, a frequentist philosophy, if you will. And with that, I want to say, all right, I will stop talking about the mean of a data set of a sample, but I will introduce the word expectation of a population. Expectation. And now I have multiple symbols. So, um, let's say of the random variable. What does delta represent here? Remember that um, when we start binning in a histogram, we have to decide on a bin width. Mm -hmm. That was delta, that was here, the bucket size. And so I'm just giving you the heuristic mental exercise of you making a histogram of outcomes and those are spikes. Then you're saying now your outcomes could be, you know, half integers or real numbers or continuous variables and then you have to define them in a bucket. And the idea of letting your number of trials, size of your sample go to very, very large, well then intuitively you know that you got to summarize them by smaller and smaller bins. And when you're doing that, you're turning a sum to an integral the way you probably began defining your integration as a calculus operation using a Riemann sum where you have boxes and you make those boxes smaller. So here it's the same thing, but I stuck that delta in here at the bottom and the top, just so that my, well, to, just to be a little bit consistent with, with what I had last time, because you made F divided by N and divided by delta, we turn that, so that's a relative frequency density. Remember little f of an outcome m is a frequency, a number of occurrences. Little f over n is the relative frequency. Little f over n divided by the bin width is a relative frequency density which if you want to go back to relative frequency, you have to integrate out against the bucket sizes, the width of it, and so the area under the histogram in this case gives us a relative frequency. And the sum of all the areas of all the bins in the little histogram then gives us one. That was our normalization. And that's how we went and defined probability. And so because of that, F over N, it, with this uh, notion, um, I'll just start writing it here. Because of that, I want to call this E for expectation. And then I typically will use curly braces of X. And another notation is an averaging bracket for X and I want to write that if I have a continuous variable that can take any value between negative infinity and plus infinity, that this sum here, 
turns into an integral which involves the value x the probability density evaluated at x and then times the bin width which is the measure the integration measure the, the dx between negative infinity and plus infinity so the way I write it, I like to see the correspondence of this integral with this sum, knowing that earlier I had mentally let f over n go to the probability. And now my outcomes are n. Sorry, uh, um, yes, that is true. Uh, I, I didn't misspeak just yet, but I was unclear, right? Here, last lecture, the area under the histogram has the absolute frequency divided by the number, which is a relative frequency, divided by the bin width, which is a probability density. When multiplied by the area, gives you a probability. So I'll annotate that here. And say that's the probability density now. I think I said that last time. But I'll just annotate this here. That's going to be our little p. And then I want to point to these numbers and say, look, that's the sum of the values multiplied by the probability density. So that turns into an x times p and then times the width of the interval. And so there's your dx. At this point, I usually forget everything else. Because, yeah, as we already noticed last week, somebody else's definition of a frequency is relative and they've been telling you, and somebody's been with is not in there, or is it? And, you know, somebody's histogram is not exactly the same. And, you know, the words get messy. I use them this way such that I end up right here with this boxed equation, which is the definition of the expectation of a random variable. And yeah, really, I should maybe capitalize X to say it's, it's a process, but I, I'm gonna do that <clears throat> haphazardly. If there is an X, let's think about the temperature outside. It is a random variable, which means it's characterized by a probability density function. What does it mean to be a probability density function? Well, it means that it, it, when integrated, it gives you the chances of occurring. When you integrate over all the possible values, it means it's possible, it's happening. That's sort of built in in the definition. And here I'm giving you an additional thing that says I define the word expectation as the integral of the variable temperature times its probability density function over all the values. And I now backwards make the argument that yeah, all right, clearly this is related to the mean of an experiment, whether it's in outcomes with frequencies or in actual numbers that you just tally up and divide. And if you now want to think about a symmetric Gaussian-like distribution, then you do know that you sum these values up of your experiment, you're gonna end up somewhere in the middle. And so that's an appropriate measure of location. And so I went from the bottom up and zigzag through it here to just go, well, look, this is the expectation of a distribution as a definition. And then very soon, I'm gonna to talk to you about how Again, we need to prove to ourselves that if we have a finite small sample and we approximate, we estimate the expectation by arithmetic averaging that we are going to be doing a good job, being on average true, being on average finding. 
what we want to find. So I'll rewrite the expectation in a moment, and the moment is now. The word moment is well chosen. Moments of a density function P, the probability density function. Okay. P of X is our density function. And I'm going to define the moment of a density function, like a moment in physics, a uh, moment of inertia, center of mass, the total mass, those are moments of a density distribution that you learn about in physics. All I want to say here is that take the argument of the function and I raise it to the nth power. And I may shift it by a value m. So right now, we got all the previous notation. I've run out of letters and I'm now going with M here. There's some shift. And N here is some power. And I'll need a symbol for my moment. Oh, and I integrate over all possible values of X. Those I could call it big M. I better give it two indices, M and N. Okay. So I define the moment like all of you have in your physics, probably mechanics as a weighted measure of some function um, well there's p of x <laughs> but if you think about p being weighted then it's x to some power and with respect to a certain reference point which is m if m is zero big m of little m being zero of the first power that I have just defined as my expectation. Big M of zero to the power zero is what again? It's just um, the integral of the probability function mm -hmm. uh, is that one has to be one right that's one and I use m here because you know and people do use it in statistics also so that's the mass in physics little p is the mass density usually rho of x the integral of rho of x over all x on a line is the mass of the rod. The integral of rho of x times x over the length of the rod is the center of mass of the rod. It's where it balances against forces. The integral of the second power of the uh, moment arm 
with respect to an offset to be determined of the mass density is a moment of inertia, which is where you talk about how it resists rotation. So it now stands the reason that I should be, so I've just slightly abstractified it. So you see, it's the same thing. I should be going to at least second order, second power, and I'm going to define in the same colors as before if my eyes work, the variance of a random variable. I'm going to box it exactly the same way. I'm now going to call it var of x, capital. And I'm going to define that as the second moment of the probability density distribution using x and a second power and letting the point with respect to which I derive the second moment be the first moment. Okay, so I'm going to use my bracket notation here. What is the variance? The expectation of the squared distance of the random variable with respect to the expectation of the random variable. So I've defined the point of reference to be the expectation. So I'll make it a miniature here with respect to the expectation. The second moment of my density distribution of probability is defined as the word the variance. And I'm now also going to list the fact that if you work this out by hand, you can equate that with the expectation of the squared variable minus the square of the expectation of the variable. I never remember that second thing without writing the first thing. So you just multiply to verify it. It's an important form of that last little bit because it's easy to calculate, especially in a computer, especially when you're doing loops, you just sum and you sum the square. That's why in the Menke book, they write out all these sums. They have a huge emphasis on sums of squares in that text. And that is because that computationally is advantageous. Where does that okay. last statement come from? That comes from, from writing this one out. So x minus ex to the square is you write the quadratic. So it's an x square and then ex times x and then x ex. And then when you take expectations of things that are already expectations, of course, they don't change. And so in the notes I'll hand out to you, that sort of stuff is worked out. It takes a line or two. But you do want to verify that. And uh, I would say verify it by hand and verify it on a, on a you know, using MATLAB and calling for mean and then doing your own sums of squares. And then you will re recognize in, a, in computational tool uh, that this is the formula that is most usually done. And that's also, that's all the way back from the time people tabulated results, you know, in the 16th century, they wrote a column of X, they wrote a column of squares, they summed it up. And so a, a human computer could do it. Okay. Um, and sure, if we want to 
use our symbols again, we could also say the expectation of x squared minus the squared expectation of x. So those are all following. The box thing is the important thing. And the general definition of moment is important because moments are everywhere. And the probability density, if you're physics minded, is like a mass density. And then it makes sense to say where, what is the total mass? Where do you expect the mass? Is the center of mass, right? The center of the earth. That's the location of the earth. And then the variance of the mass density, or rather in this definition, the variance of the mass distribution around the center of mass. That turns into the rotational properties of moments of inertia, but that is maybe taking it too far. Okay. And then again, you will imagine that you can keep going, that you can up your powers, third power, fourth power, and so on. For nice symmetric distributions, these things become increasingly uninteresting. They do have words. The words are skewness and kurtosis, but frankly, I haven't heard anyone use kurtosis in polite conversation lately. And so at this moment, they are just words. Well, maybe a couple of additional points about this sort of a thing, which makes the moments. It's an integral of a function. It's a linear operator on X when N equals one, when N equals two, it's a quadratic operator. When N equals three, it's a cubic operator, right? So I'll be using it and saying it often, but the expectation of a function X, of a variable X, I should say, probably, is a linear operator, which means you can multiply it by numbers and add to it and you preserve all of that stuff because you just integrate. And the variance is a quadratic operator. And immediately I read into that, that your expectation as the units of whatever it is that you're measuring, your temperature and your quadratic measure the variance, measure of energy, measure in squared units. The thing that I think immediately follows now as being of interest, and that is, well, what is the covariance of, you know, two random variables? And very soon, any number of random variables. Well, I would clearly just write it out and say, okay, covariance of X and Y now. They were gonna be black. Put my brackets down. I need a quadratic, but in two variables. So that's a product of those two variables. I'll be needing my X. I'll be needing my Y. I'll be wanting to specify their respective points of references, namely their expectations. I'm writing just a regular X and Y. I see I'm scripting a little bit, but that's unintended. Uh, well, and so that's it, right? And um, will I have room? I'll write it like this. Just supply the definition. Integrate over the entire domain write out the quadratic on the inside of your integral, your X, your Y, your reference being the expectation of that X and the expectation of that Y. And what's your probability density function? Well, you're gonna need 
the thing that characterizes those two things, namely the joint probability density of X and Y. integrated over dx dy. Okay. That's it. So that gets boxed and clearly maybe that's the only box I should have written because clearly the variance of X is the covariance of X with itself. Special case. Other special case, if X and Y are independent, that's what I started with in the lecture. Very special case, not always true. And we know that X and Y, the joint distribution, turn out to be multiplied versions of the individual distributions. And then I don't have space to work that out, but it does take you one line. Then their covariance is zero. So you look at your integral and you say, all right, just multiply it out. X times Y times PXY minus expectation of X times Y my P plus C to the square times that. You just literally write it out. And then you see that if you can replace P, the probability density function of X and Y as a two variable function by a product of two separable probability function, and you look left, and you look right, then they cancel each other. And that is the one liner that you should do at home to verify that yes, when two random variables are independent, their joint probability distribution is a product of their probability density distributions. And in that case, the covariance by this definition and its only definition is zero, which is also probably consistent with your daily life and knowing stuff that, yep, independent things, they do not co-vary. It's sort of in the name that that should be zero. Okay. Maybe I'll write one more thing that directly relates to this. And that is, well, with this only definition possible of covariance right here, I'm just going to do a terminology and I'll say, what is the correlation of two random variables? And so, yeah, I'm aware that covariance is usually without a dash, but I want you to think about it as the co and then the variance. And you are aware that correlation is with two R's, but that's really just a misspelling of correlation. So I emphasize that here. So the correlation is just a normalized version of their covariance. Cov or covar, I think I'm gonna write more often cov. And they're gonna be usually curly braces, but sometimes they're gonna be just parentheses. I'll talk you through it. Various notations exist. So if I take my covariance, I'm just, how about I just write it down and then I discuss it. And I normalize it by the variance of the individual processes. knowing that covariance is a quadratic operator and the variance obviously is a quadratic operator. I have powers too many, so I'm going to take a square root now. Now the powers are matched. I'm gonna give this a symbol. Let's call it R. So this is my definition of the correlation. 
is a normalized covariance. And I should call it R of X and Y, obviously. Function of X and Y. You will soon see that it is limited to being greater than negative one and smaller than one. And that it is a thing that has no units. So I want to just bring it back using a picture to something you either already know, and then you have a nice picture. Or you didn't know when you learned something, or you knew it a different way. And, um, okay, I'm drawing two axes. An X and a Y. Two random variables. And let me say that I actually did conduct an experiment and I have a sample of N begin. And let's say that they just fall this way. And think about X being um, I don't know, temperature. In Celsius or Kelvin, I suppose. And think about why as being weight or mass in kilogram of your sample. And I am telling you where zero is. Right now, zero is here. But what I really want to do is tell you something about the spread of my values. And so I do want to say, how about we define the mean of X as my new reference. Sorry, yes, that's the mean of X. And so now I have a new Y axis. So that now you read these axes as not just what the temperature is, but what the temperature deviation is with respect to the mean. And similarly, I re-baseline I'm doing some serious data editing here to make my picture have more gravitas. Similarly, I re-baseline my data sample here to the mean of y, such that now it becomes, is it more or less than arithmetic mean? Okay. So that's like saying X minus the expectation of X in the population sense and Y minus the expectation of X. But these two axes have different units and that also does not make any sense. If I tell you, and again, that's back to lecture two maybe, spread, I really need to tell you this in terms of how unusual it is, how many times the standard deviation variance is all going to come together it is and so i am going to normalize my axes by dividing y by the spread of y and i'm going to use the standard deviation of y for that 
and I'm going to divide the x axis by the standard deviation of x. And I owe all of you and myself for completeness the fact that and standard deviation is defined as the square root of the variance. Okay. You knew that. The standard deviation is a square root of the variance, which means it has the units of the axis, which means that if I divide my axis by the standard deviation, I have not only expressed my axis markings in terms of standard deviation, but I've also made that unitless. So instead of being temperature in Celsius, my new axis will have markings that say one times sigma Uh, plus one, not a good choice of label here, but I make it so. Plus one, three times the STD, one times STD, two times STD on the negative axis and so on. And similarly here, I'm gonna draw a pencil lines. how about that? So now my axis markets up markings are in numbers of standard deviations out. Same here. No more units, no more arbitrary zero reference, where zero is not a reference for a human weight. Nobody weighs nothing. Um, zero is not a good reference for body temperature, nobody is at absolute zero. So, you know, you're shifting the location and we're scaling by the spread. And so this is plus one, the standard deviation of y on the axis, minus one standard deviation of y, and so on. So let me just build this back up. I have an x. And I have just decided I'm going to shift it with respect to its mean. And I do the same with Y. But that still has units. But you can see that what I have is the sample definition almost of the variance, right? My variance was the expectation of the product of X expressed with respect to its expectation and Y with respect to its expectation. So if I did another division by one over n, I'd be having the sample definition of the standard deviation. But I'm working on correlation right now. And so I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna divide this by the square root of the variance, which is the standard deviation. And, um, Well, how about I write it out? This is why the sums of squares are messy, right? I'm gonna divide this by the square root. 
of one over n of the square. It gets complicated and it doesn't give you any more insight. I'm just going to write it out just to say it. X with respect to its mean, here is a one over n sum over n of all x, y again. Um, I'm going to do a J here because I pre-calculate the mean as a new index. And now I'm going to sum over I, all of those pairs that I have. There's another trick you need to get used to, right? Every time you nest equations, you need to make your indices, indices uh, reflect that. So the dummy index is here, sum over J to get my arithmetic mean, and the distance thereof squared, summed over all such distances that I can have and normalized. That's the standard deviation of the sample. I do the same thing on the y-axis, so now it's normalized, one over n, sum over all pairs, distances of y with respect to its appropriate summary location. 1 over n, 1 through n, y, and then, oh my god, 1 over n, sum j from 1 to n, i, j. You have to write this out once and then just talk yourself through it. I'm writing, if you will, a discrete version, a sample version, and we'll return to that, of the standard deviation. We'll talk about it much more of the two things, just as a way to normalize it, and just as a way to reference it. The shifting happens here. That's like a new axis. And the scaling happens here. Those are new axis markings in terms of the numbers of standard deviation. And I'm gonna make these little ones J also because I'm about to introduce the next index. And then I'll be very quickly done. So, if I keep my I index, I hope you will allow me to do this. And I say that because I want to have an index i, knowing that I've already multiplied out or divided out my other index i, which is down there. If you don't like it, we'll make it i prime. So scaled, shifted, pairs x, i, y, y. So now I just want you to look at one such observation here, this red you know, point. What I care about is finding how distance is it from its mean in units of standard deviation of x and y and um, this is a combination of where it's positively distanced from its mean in x and y so there is going to be a plus multiplying a plus as opposed to this point here which is going to be smaller than its expectation in Y and smaller than its expectation in X, scaled in units of standard deviation. So that's a minus multiplying a minus. And the rare cases that I have here, top left, this is negatively distanced from the mean of X and positively distanced from the mean of Y. So that's the case where a negative is gonna multiply a positive. 
And then I have the third case of a, uh, whatever, diamond star, which is negatively distanced from y, positively distanced from x, and so that's a plus multiplying a negative. And so if you look at the product, all those individual products in your sample, just like the definition of covariance had, after scaling and shifting, and then you mentally classify a point cloud that is like this here, the way I've drawn it, then you're going to have multiple pairs being plus, plus, or, must, or minus, minus, So this quadrant here is minus multiplying a minus. This quadrant here is a plus multiplying a plus. This is a plus multiplying a minus. And this is a minus multiplying a plus. Um, if that is the point cloud and you product all those pairs and you sum all of them up, and this is an example where I've now made this summary of my data in the situation drawn on the sheet. Is that number going to be positive or is it going to be negative? I have literally drawn my samples. And I've tried to walk you through that I have an original black axis, but I've rebaselined it to the location of X and Y respectively. And I've scaled my axes to be unitless and marked in terms of the standard deviation of X's in unity. And I've attempted to write that equation as doing just that. I had an X and I had a Y, shifted it so that the distances from their mean, scaled it such that those distances are expressed in terms of their standard deviation and drawn contours on the sort of like to guide your eye. And I've divided the axis axes into the, you know, top left, negative plus, top right, time plus plus, positively distance on both axes, axes plus minus and minus minus. And if I literally try to guess what the outcome of this operation is for this drawing, tell me if this is going to be a positive number or a negative number. Positive? It's positive because you, I want you to see that I have many more samples in my plus plus and minus minus quadrants, which will multiply to large numbers together. And I have relatively few terms to add that have the negative plus and the positive plus, uh, negative combination, right? Okay, so um, if you want to indulge me one final time, I'm going to call this R of the two variables X and Y. And I'm going to think that I went back and forth on, I will call this rho. And the reason, and this is where I want to want to uh, uh, quit for today, is that well, look, I began by giving you an arithmetic mean, then I went to expectation. Then I noticed this is going to be a probability density moment. Then I went into moments, and I defined variance. Then I defined covariance. Then I defined correlation, and I was in population world. These things exist. We populate, postulate that they are a thing. We may not know what they are. And so I'll reserve the row for the population correlation coefficient. Then I'm showing you a sample and I'll reserve the letter R here for the sample correlation coefficient. Nobody in his right mind ever remembers this without spending this much time writing it down and walking themselves through it, okay?
So what I want you to remember is that a PDF has a zeroth moment of one, a first moment, which is the expectation, a second moment with respect to the first moment, which is the variance. Make that multidimensional, multiple random variables, and you're talking about covariance. Covariance has units. Nobody wants to know that your zinc sample in the oven has a covariance in the data of Kelvin kilogram. But you want to scale your plots such that you can express their relation as a correlation, as a normalized number between negative one and one. That makes more sense. Then you can do your experiment in any unit that you want because you're always just measuring it with respect to the standard deviation, which of course itself is measured with respect to the expectation. And that is the effect of shifting my axes to the new expectation and scaling it so that I can read off the units in terms of standard deviations. And when you do that for a sample and you have point clouds that are oriented like this, bottom left to the top right, then you have pluses talking to you. And I know I'm five minutes late, but I'm gonna go very, very quickly point you to the handout, the Strogatz paper about Bayes rule here. I've just illustrated to you some case where my point clouds, here's my reference, appropriately scaled, lots of plus, plus, minus, minus pairs, that's a positive correlation coefficient in this sample. Walk yourself backwards through the exercise, you get things that are negative. The tighter the correlation, the more close to one it is, either negative or positive. The more non-correlated these variables are, including the case where they are independent, they'll just have a circular type of point cloud because you're gonna just have quadrants with just as many plus plus as negative negative pairs. So that's the top of this figure. The bottom of the figure is the most important figure of all. And that is to say, if the variables are independent, the correlation is zero. If the variables are correlated, due to dependence, the correlation is not going to be zero. However, the bottom line here, these are all examples where there is a clear dependence of the variable. And yet all the correlation coefficients are zero. So this is, it is not because the correlation is zero that the variables are independent, but rather if the variables are independent, the correlation is zero. I hope you recognize this from your earliest math lessons that if then doesn't apply the then if backwards pair, okay? And so independence implies zero correlation because then P of X, Y is a separable P of X times P of Y. You write down the definition of covariance it cancels. Correlation surely then cancels too. But in the bottom row examples, I might have a sinusoidal dependence of x and y, a square or smiley face, whatever shape you have, a completely functional dependence of these things. And yet the geometry of it such works out that if this relation is not linear, then I still map it onto a zero correlation coefficient. So, oh, independent, there we are. So the bottom row doesn't imply at all independence, rather the contrary, given the inspection of the shape. Whereas the top row shows only one case of independence where the correlation coefficient is zero.